Thank you everyone for coming today. I know more people are coming in. My name is Poe Bronson. I am the Managing Director at IndieBio. I'm here at IndieBio uh, today. We uh, have some COVID testing companies that are developing uh, their tests here. And so we're in a very safe place. We have a terrific panel today. IndieBio has a few other events coming up and we will put into the chat the links to our demo day and upcoming events on the new biotech and on uh, from biomanufacturing as a technology. Uh, today, we're here to talk about food and the, and the pandemic and what it's sort of done to our food system and what we can do about it. Um, you know, when the pandemic hit, we were all aware of how we couldn't make our own toilet paper. We couldn't make ventilators. We couldn't make masks. It was troubling that our industrialization had been so gutted that we couldn't do such basic things. But one of the industrial sectors that is where we do do end-to-end -end manufacturing, where we grow things from the scratch and we get it to the finished product and feed people is in the food sector. But even this sector was hit quite hard. You know, uh, milk was being poured out on farms where pork processing wasn't available, hogs are being asphyxiated. Rice was uh, on boats was piling up at ports. It was very troubling to see at the same time as the lines at food banks would sometimes be eight hours long. Prices were going up on people, restaurants were closing. The plant workers had COVID, the peaches and the onions had salmonella, and even some of our schools had legionella. Not, not that that necessarily relates to the food system, but it really painted a light for uh, the people on our panel today who have been real pioneers and leaders in reinventing the food system to uh, making their work all the more important than ever. And, you know, uh, we eat a ton of food. Now, when I say we eat a ton of food, I don't mean a, a metaphorical ton of food. I mean that we in America eat 1,900 and 96 pounds of food per person per year, almost at exactly a ton. And it's a major, massive logistical hurdle to move things along. And so to here to talk about it today, uh, we, I'll let them say hi. We have a four esteemed panelists and very, very excited to have them and welcome them. We have Bruce Friedrich from the Good Food Institute, author of two books, Clean Protein and um, is one of the most famous of these books. You've seen him on TED. He's really the, one of the most leading spokespeople for the transformation of the food sector. Um, Bruce, real quick lightning round question to you. One, what did you eat last night for dinner? And one sentence about it. Uh, what did we eat last night for dinner? I think we had rice uh, and green curry with a lot of broccoli and one sentence about it. Um, my wife is a phenomenal cook and it was insanely delicious. Great. Thank you, Bruce. And we also have with us today Christine Mosley. She's the founder and CEO of Full Harvest. Full Harvest is just amazing and it's taking, it's a B2B platform that takes all this imperfect produce and surplus produce and she connects it between farms and food and beverage country uh, companies. Uh, welcome, Christine, and one-liner on uh, what you had for dinner last night. Um, I had one of my first socially distanced outdoor dinners with a couple friends, which was really nice, and they cooked for us. So it was um, salad and grilled steak and chicken. It was delicious. And some peppers from their garden, which was great. Great. Uh, and then we also have James Joaquin, uh, co-founder and managing director at Obvious Ventures. Uh, James is uh, someone I look up to very much because he's been doing what we do at Indiebio for far longer. And uh, he invests in many things and has been on the boards of many companies, but real leader in the plant forward approach to food system, uh, leading investor for a long time in Beyond Meat and Miyoko's Creamery. Uh, James, what did you have for dinner last night? Well, last night, my wife and I and our two teenagers uh, cooked up a skillet of Beyond Beef. Apologies for the product plug, but true story. <laughs> with some tomato sauce. And the cool thing was different family members then put that on different things. So my daughter had it on gluten-free pasta because she's gluten-free. Wife and son had it on, you know, uh, good old fashioned pasta. And I had it on these weird 
uh, zero carb plant noodles that I found on Good Eggs. Great. And then our fourth panelist is Tom Tomich. Uh, he's at UC Davis, where he's the founder of the Food Systems Lab, and he's a professor of sustainability science and policy. It's great to have a pol with Bruce here as well, a policy perspective rather than just a product uh, like uh, us and James perspective on this. Um, Tom, thank you for coming. W what did you have for dinner last night? So it was Salmon Taco Tuesday with a, a green salad on the side. And the noteworthy thing is the, the salad had a, a mezcal and lime dressing, which I thought kind of made the whole meal. Um, just to make the point that, you know, it's really great to have the local fresh vegetables we have here in California. And at the same time, I still uh, really enjoy the cultural connectivity. If, if we didn't have the link to Oaxaca to get the mezcal in, we'd be missing that out. So it's That's one of those with and things. Okay, one more lightning round question for all of you. And you can go good or bad in the direction of this. So you're uh, a farm or facility that you've visited, like I know we haven't been out visiting everything during the pandemic, but let's just say the last year or year or so, um, that is either your fav favorite or your worst. And I'll, I'll just go first. I'll tell you, uh, Michelle, my wife is from Louisiana. And when I was visiting our son there in October, I had to go by and see uh, right below Lake Pontchartrain in Convent the mosaic fertilizer plant. So all the fertilizer that's being made, they have this 200 foot tall, half mile by quarter mile, chemical time bomb sitting on the sugarcane plantation. And it is, holds 56 billion pounds of acidic radioactive waste. And the gypsum wall is slipping and then, then all of Louisiana is freaked out about this. And I had to go stand there behind the sugar cane and take pictures of it myself. Uh, we're extremely worried. It won't actually go into the Mississippi, which it's on, but if it slips, it would go into Lake Pontchartrain and the swamp. So that's mine. You all get one lightning round question to a favorite or worst. Who wants to go first? I, I, I go ahead. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Christy. Um, well, I, I don't want to say names because you know it's it's sensitive, but um, uh, and I also don't want it to seem like it's their fault; it's the system's fault. But it's um, relevant in that it's why I started my business. Um, my moment that I knew kind of what full harvest needed to be was when I went to one of the largest uh, lettuce growers in the country and watched as they were harvesting only twenty-five to thirty percent of the romaine head to perfectly bag it for grocery stores and let up to 75% fall to the ground um, while I was just stepping up to my calves on perfectly edible food that could have gone easily into the green juices. I was previously helping um, you know, in a plant-based organic company that I helped run prior. Um, and just seeing more going to waste than was actually being harvested and consumed um, was just heartbroken. It just broke my heart. Um, and that was what really led to the impetus of starting my company. So hope that very soon here we can solve that at scale. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, well, mine's bittersweet. I mean, my family started farming tree fruit here in California in 1897. And I've been going out to the family orchards a lot this year because um, they're in liquidation and it's my fate to be the one that sells the family farm. And that's because now in California, if you get below about 50 acres, you can't, it doesn't pencil out with the price of water and price of labor and the cost of uh, compliance with various regulations. There are all good reasons for that, but it's just really tough. So it's, it's kind of the flip side of Christine's story. Bruce? Um, I think one of the things, uh, so GFI does a lot of granting um, on plant-based uh, and cultivated meat. I don't think we have a grant at Wageningen University, but uh, going and touring their facility and hearing their researchers talking about the open source work that they are doing to build on the idea that I think Ethan Brown probably had first at Beyond Meat, which is that we can make meat from plants. Meat is made up of lipids, aminos, minerals, and water. Um, so we can figure out how to give people everything that they like about meat without the myriad external costs. 
Wageningen uh, is consistently ranked the number one uh, agricultural university uh, in the world uh, in competition with UC Davis, which I think uh, is right up there at the top. Uh, are you saying Wageningen is two? Is UC Davis one? No, we switch back and forth, but we're, we're, we're second now. Okay. Uh, the work they're doing um, in an open access way to divorce meat production from the need for live animals is just inspirational. Great. Thanks. And James? Well, I'll mention a, a, a positive memory of a visit. It's been hard to visit anything uh, during this pandemic, but uh, going back a ways, um, I visited a, a meadery in West Marin in the Point Reyes National Seashore. There's a there's a place called, I believe it's Hyde Run Meadery, where they are their own apiary. So they're running a large beehive um, you know, facility and making their own honey, which they then use to create a fermented sparkling honey wine. Amazing product. That's great. We, uh, we love bees. Bees are the one topic that Democrats and Republicans can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> it's listed as the official topic. So, uh, and they're an invasive species. Yeah, so let's take a second here. So to the audience, we can't see you right now. Normally, if we were talking with you, we'd be with you, we'd be with you in the room, we'd see you, we'd be talking to you. And I just want to acknowledge, so the chat is for chat. If you have questions for the panelists, use the Q&A and we'll see that as well. And those will organize them. But if you could, audience, you're out there, just to let us know you're out there, go into the chat and put an exclamation mark or something to let us know you're there. It helps us really remember that we're talking to you and not just to each other. I want to, um, to the panelists, I just want to just take this big question of robustness of the food system, right? And its ability to really help everybody, not just some, and, and help people in hard times and in good times. And if you could share like what you and your organization are doing and how that's helping us uh, see a stronger, more robust, better future food system. And um, Bruce, let's start with you uh, at, at GFI. Well, you mentioned policy and GFI's number one policy priority uh, is to convince governments that they should be funding research like the research that GFI is funding. We've given away about $8 million uh, to projects all over the world uh, to help advance in an open access way uh, plant-based and cultivated meat. Cultivated meat is just growing meat directly from cells rather than funneling crops through animals. Uh, plant-based meat is biomimicking meat with plants. Um, but in the way that governments put tens of billions of dollars into renewable energy and governments even pre-COVID put more than $100 billion per year into global health initiatives, our number one policy goal is to convince governments that they should be putting money uh, into plant-based and cultivated meat research. And one of the most exciting things to happen uh, in this regard recently happened at UC Davis, the National Science Foundation. Um, it actually just went up on Davis's website today, uh, but maybe 10 days ago announced that they were giving $3.5 million for cultivated meat R&D, which is uh, definitely a start. But GFI has, a policy, has policy teams in India Israel, Brazil, Asia Pacific, Europe, and the United States. Uh, and our number one goal is to convince governments that there should be a food version of the space race. Uh, governments should be racing to divorce meat from the need for live animals with all of the external costs that come with that. Yeah, the uh, average sugar farmer is, gets a $700,000 annual subsidy in the US and that's just feeding back into the petroleum system um, and I think what you're describing here is uh, a much more robust system that's built on plants rather than animals. Yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, Christine, will you tell us a little more about Full Harvest? Um, it sounds amazing. Like, how did you build this and how did it get big and, and can it really, really work? Um, sure, happy to... Um give you my background. So, you know, as I mentioned, that that Romaine story is kind of what I saw that really uh, was the moment that I realized what Full Harvest needed to be after working in 15 years within supply chain and in the food industries. 
Um, I'd seen the downstream inefficiencies, but seeing it at the farm level really uh, struck a chord with me at the same time that food waste data had just come out, which um, has gotten even more sophisticated over the last few years. And we just recently, um, last year, uh, brought to light a, a huge study by Santa Clara University that found that one third of all edible produce in the US does not leave the farm level. So we hear all this 40% food waste stats, but that's pretty much after the farm. There's one third that doesn't even leave the farm. And it's purely just because it's excess or it's just not perfectly shaped for retailers. And so that's really what we're here to solve at Full Harvest is that on-farm food loss problem. Because any other industry that would be losing that much just at the production level would not be in business. And that's what's feeding our country and, and the world. And so um, with climate change and now things like COVID and impacting, we've got people going hungry, one in six people in the US now going hungry. It's just, we, you know, it's, it's unimaginable. It's, it's, a it's a disaster waiting to happen, you know? And so um, it's really just a logistics and technology problem um, where, you know, we, prov we produce enough food. And so how we're solving it at Full Harvest is, um, you know, I give the metaphor of, um, Airbnb a lot, you know, imagine if Airbnb tried to scale over the phone, it just wouldn't have <laughs> been a business. Um, and that marketplace connected people, uh, you know, to unlock billions of dollars of excess inventory sales and revenue. The issue prior to Full Harvest was that um, farmers were trying to scale this excess inventory problem over the phone. And it just wasn't scalable. And, you know, it's a, on top of that, they're struggling financially and they're, um, it's a perishable product and they didn't have access to these burgeoning plant-based companies and, under, and even the resources to, you know, and sales to find that. And so over the phone, trying to move product, you know, quickly at a discount is just not efficient. And so saw the huge opportunity to create a marketplace similar to how Airbnb did it for real estate um, for this acceptance inventory so that within a few clicks of a button, farmers can produce, uh, post this, their produce and grow um, buyers that don't need a carrot produce looks like can buy it more easily. Um, up to 96% of produce is purchased offline currently over phone and emails and text messages. And it's 2020 and I, I joke that we're, we have flying cars now and we're, how can we still be you know, ordering food um, produce over the phone? Um, and COVID just put an even bigger light on the issue. You know, Without technology, um, it just makes the already broken offline system that much worse and more going to waste and more people going hungry. And technology is really the only thing that can quickly shift supply demand in these, um, you know, quick changes and, and situations. So, as you mentioned earlier, I think now Full Harvest is even more important than ever before. Um, and we're still the only company out there really solving the on-farm food loss problem um, and getting that to businesses that, um, you know, the, the burgeoning plant-based industry. So, yeah. It seems it seems uh, uh, amazing, and it's it's do you, do, you, do do the products go to all like it's you're getting way way more now uh, food and beverage companies and restaurants willing to use the product and sort of change their space. Yeah, well, during COVID, less so on the food service side, we weren't really hyper focused on that area yet. Anyways, fortunately, um, you know, although we see an opportunity there in the future, but um, really focused on plant based uh, CPG companies and. Um, and processors, and then um, during COVID, started getting into servicing with partnerships with large nonprofits, boxes of produce to underserved families and homes, schools, nonprofits, food banks. Um, which you know, we aren't going to. We're, we're always going to be B two B. We're not going to directly you know deliver that to consumers ourselves. But there's a lot of opportunity now with people more at home and more people going hungry for us to help connect the dots between our growers with extra product to these new channels. Um, and so not only that, but in the last six to nine months, even just right before COVID, there's been this huge um, rapid shift of big CPG companies now um, really interested in being more sustainable. Um, the market's just shifting rapidly. There was a big study that was just done that found that the number one trend of consumer relevance in food is now waste reduction, number two, sourcing responsibly, and number three, regenerative ag. Now all over things like you know, clean label and, and sugar and, and healthy um, contents and so the, the market is shifting and uh, we're excited that in the coming weeks and months we're going to be launching with three of the largest food companies in the world um, co-branded and co-developed um, uh, products with 100% rescued vegetables that would have gone to waste so more affordable healthy delicious sustainable snacks that help food waste so really excited about this new I think trend that um, we're helping to 
be the fuel to, to, um, to speed up. Great. Tom, at, at, uh, at UC Davis, at the Food Systems Lab, and in your, in your policy work, what are, what are you pushing for most these days? Yeah, well, so we founded the Food Systems Lab just beginning of July this year. And it grows out of work that we've been doing on the mashup between Silicon Valley technology and this very dynamic, innovative ag sector we have in California. Um, but why? So it's really about building a smarter food system. So it's related to what Christine was talking about. Um, I'm an economist. Markets are, about, are a big information system. But it turns out that for food and agriculture in particular, there are a lot of massive shortcomings in that market information system, which actually threaten the sustainability of, of the planet, food supply, but more broadly. So food's important culturally, food's important environmentally in terms of water, climate. So it's a big information problem. So we're working on how do we bring modern information technology into this? And everybody says, well, blockchain, it turns out it's fairly challenging because we're talking about integrating information and making it open access across phenomena that go from molecular to planetary and just the architecture of doing that. Then if you start really taking, I mean, I think Bruce would appreciate this. The food system is about profits and it's also about power. And if you're really going to take this seriously, you need to bring in ontologies that allow us to understand more about well, who's pulling the levers? Who's got the power here? So it's, um, it's about the sorts of things like traceability and trust and transparency, but it's also in terms of informing policymaking and informing all of us. So what are the trade-offs that we really need to make and how can we make them in as, as smart a way as possible? And I know it sounds a bit naive to say, well, if, if we just had better information, things would get better. However, if you work with people, bring information into that debate, there is a, at least a possibility of getting to a better place together, whether it's pollination that everybody loves, Poe, or if we've done work on nitrogen here in California where the, the ag business interests and the environmental justice advocates actually found a, found a space to work together. So we need more of that. And that's what the Food Systems Lab is about. Yeah, and, and I think our, the biggest thing is that these people with power, the organizations with power, I should say, uh, I think this is Christine was saying as well, we're seeing a shift in their desire to really be more sustainable now. And that while all of you here in Bio, we've been doing work for years and many of you decades, there seems, and, and and we talked about so many new alternative proteins. We're really at an inflection point right now, actually. James, do you want to chime in here and tell us what you've been doing at Obvious and your companies, but even beyond that? Well, I'd love to start with why, you know, why we exist at Obvious. We, we co-founded the firm with this shared belief that venture capital should be funding entrepreneurs, startups that are building disruptive solutions to systemic challenges. Instead of more ad tech and disappearing photo apps, how do we actually build solutions to climate change, to chronic disease, to income inequality? And you know, unfortunately, the list of systemic challenges is, is even longer than that. But when we look at the size of these industries, there are many of these, these problem industries are trillion dollar industries. And the food industry is certainly you know, one of the biggest, right? It's a multi-trillion dollar industry. We're interested in how do we flip the food system from being part of the problem to being part of the solution. And, you know, when we zoom out and look at the last 50 plus years, our food system has processed and packaged its way into very, very uh, cheap calories. And it's, a, it, it's an amazing achievement, right? There, there's a lot of good that came from cheap calories at scale but there's a lot of negative externalities along the way. We think the food system is 40% or more of human created greenhouse gases coming from that full stack of animal husbandry. The use of antibiotics in animal agriculture has led to superbugs, all the antibiotic resistant human infections we believe are linked you know, to this food system. So 
it's essentially a system with great fragility, and we want to flip that into an anti-fragile food system. One of our earliest investment themes at Obvious was the idea of plant-based protein. It's the, a lot of the work that Bruce and, and his team have pioneered. You know, can we cut out the middleman and just make delicious, nutritious center of plate protein from plants? And Ethan Brown, the co-founder of Beyond Meat, was one of our early investments. We also led the seed round uh, backing Miyoko Shinner, the founder of Miyoko's Creamery, creating vegan cheese and butter. We're early investors in Urban Remedy, doing fresh, locally produced, plant-forward food products. So we, we were early on this idea, and we've been fortunate to see some early signs of both positive financial success and positive uh, environmental and human health returns around this idea of, um, you know, taking the animal out of the equation and let's move to a plant forward uh, diet without losing all of the history and culture and taste and texture and yumminess that is food. We think it's an and not an or. You, if you do it right, if you innovate in the right way, you can have both. Well, let's talk more about, you know, cost. Like, let's, I like where you're going with this. I mean, Today in our society, 70% of Americans earn less than $50,000 a year and don't have more than $500 in savings. And we, I think we all know in our hearts how important this is that we, you know, that we make our food affordable. And at the same time that the costs right now are subsidized, I can, I know because I've worked with them, but like if you're making a can of chili or a can of soup, the meat is the most expensive ingredient in there. Right. And so by, by eliminating the meat, you're absolutely eliminating some of the things that are driving the costs here. But beyond that, I used to say all the time, you know, you can't feed the world one hipster at a time. Like, <laughs> and look, I'm a hipster. I go to the food trucks. I pay, you know, $9 for something at the food truck. But, you know, your average family of four is trying to feed themselves on $20 a day. And... So how do, what are you, what are all of you pounds? Any of you still chime in, but how, how do we make sure that this is a food movement is a food movement for everyone. The food movement is accessible. Tom, yeah, please. Yeah, well, I think in many higher income countries, we put too much on the food system in terms of alleviation of poverty. In other words, we say, well, food's gotta be so cheap because people who don't have adequate income need to be able to eat. And I, I think that, so there's a, there's a really big and complicated question about just the future of, of work and how are people going to make a living. As long as we continue to kind of push the food system down, we're not going to be able to get these uh, progress in these other areas, which really require full cross cost pricing, not just market pricing, but uh, it was James that mentioned externalities. But the other part of it, if you go outside the U.S., where we're like three or four percent of us in the U.S. work in agricultural production. If you go to sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia, it's more like 40, 50 percent. And there, a lot of hunger is actually among people who grow food or work in food. So again, it's about livelihoods. It's not about, about cheap food. And so I see entrepreneurship and expansion of opportunities and the right policies as being the way that we, we can make sure that this abundance continues and that everybody has a place at the table. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, on the question of meat specifically, um, people don't think about this, but it's just, once you think about it, it's, it's hard to stop thinking about it. Um, the vast majority of the crops that are grown globally um, are fed to farm animals. So according to the World Resources Institute, the most efficient meat at turning crops uh, into meat. The most efficient animal at turning crops into meat is the chicken. Uh, it takes nine calories fed to a chicken to get one calorie back out. So Christine's talking about food waste and that's probably something that's interested, interesting to everybody on the call where literally the physiology of the chicken dictates 800% food waste. Um, and it's not just that eight calories for every one you consume are fed to the chicken and burned off or turned into feathers and blood and bones. But then you're shipping all of the, you know, so it's nine times as much land, nine times as much water, nine times as many pesticides and herbicides. You're shipping that stuff to a feed mill and operating a feed mill. You're shipping the feed to the farm. You're operating the farm. You're shipping the animals to the slaughterhouse. You're operating the slaughterhouse. Like environmentally, 
it's insanely wasteful. And this is the reason that Eric Schmidt, when he was talking about tech innovations that he thinks will um, have an order of magnitude positive impact for humanity, uh, the first thing he was talking about is plant-based meat. And it's not so that hipsters uh, can eat, you know, Beyond Burgers and Impossible Burgers. It's, it's because this inefficiency is insane. And it's the reason the Amazon rainforest is on fire and that subsistence farmers in the Amazon are being thrown off their land. Uh, it's the reason uh, throughout, you know, the famine in Ethiopia, the famine in Somalia, those countries are growing food for export to feed to agricultural animals. And it makes absolutely no sense. So, um, you know, at the Good Food Institute, our, our, you know, we operate in China, we operate in India, we operate in Brazil. Um, and our focus is not on, you know, foodies in developed economies. Our focus is on how do we feed close to 10 billion people by 2050? We don't do it with the inefficiencies of cycling crops through animals. And how do we do it without the same adverse impact on climate on, on the climate? And you know, one of our funders is the, the Gates Foundation, um, and it's through their global health, the global health side, not the agriculture side. Um, it's focused on basically turning millets into you know, something palatable, high quality protein in India, which has uh, the highest rate of stunning, the highest rate of malnutrition. And that's something that, uh, you know, the, the, meat, the meat industry is a big part of this problem in terms of inefficiency and in terms of the range of environmental harms. And we can, one of the really, the, so the, the sort of thing we need to do is we need products that taste the same or better and that cost the same or less. Right. That's the holy grail. Um, we can do that with plants. We can do that with cultivation. And because it's so much more efficient, it will be less expensive. Um, and this is how we feed the world. It's a simple math equation at scale. It, it, you know, Bruce lays out the, the case perfectly. It, you're just taking out this very expensive, inefficient middleman that also happens to cause soil damage and greenhouse gases and a whole bunch of other things. Um, now, to get to scale is the journey that we're on, and that's part of the role that investors like me play, and it's part of the role, Poe, that hipsters like you play, that sometimes these products have to start more expensive in the Western world, but that's just a bridge to getting to scale. And, you know, at scale, we should be at parity pricing or less. You know, it's unfortunate that a lot of U.S. tax dollars are subsidizing a lot of the animal agriculture that Americans consume. Um, but if you're poor in America, eating a vegetarian diet is actually the most affordable uh, protein-based diet you can, you can buy today. Um, and and it's, it's just cheaper calories. And so we ought to be able to do that with innovation, make those products you know, taste as good or better than the familiar animal products we grew up with. Price is actually the other part of why I started Full Harvest. Um, I helped scale one of the first green juice companies in the US and I was frustrated that they were selling $13 green juices um, because they were paying top dollar for perfect looking organic produce to then just process it. And um, to the point on efficiency, I mean, that is just um, not necessary, you know, especially when we are wasting a third at, at the farm level. And, you know, it's supply demand and pricing, you know, there is, um, twice, and I think even growing, uh, much demand for organic as there is supply, yet we're leaving a third at the farm. So we critically have to get more into the system um, that is perfectly edible, especially for people that don't need to care what it looks like. And so, you know, at scale, that's what we really want to try to optimize for is that the people that, you know, are, are part of our mission is that, you know, consumer packaged good companies are utilizing this excess produce to the fullest extent possible. And if the market was efficient right now, 100% of applesauce would be made of ugly apples. And it's not, you know, it's less than half. And it's just because it's so over the phone and just difficult, you know, within their network. So that's really the other piece of what we're trying to help with is fundamentally lowering the cost of healthy food production just by bringing more product into the market and making it more affordable because it's just, you know, not perfect looking. Tom, you were gonna say something here. Yeah, well, I think it's worth giving a chunk of our attention to the, the meat and livestock part of the food system because when I look at the potential disruptors of the food system, it's amazing how many of them either directly or indirectly are gonna drive change in, in meat. And 
there's the, the wave of prosperity that the planet seemed to be enjoying. I mean, we get kind of down, but this is actually one of the great times. If you're going to be born in our species, this actually is the time to do it. Um, and so with everybody getting better off and people converging toward North American type diets, we can't, the, the real risk is exporting this kind of CAFO concentrated animal feeding operation system everywhere. And that's the way it was headed. So I, I completely agree. I lose sleep over the, the whole issue of um, acceleration of antibiotic resistance, which I think is one of the great underemphasized questions. Climate change, however, that was all along. I do think that the ruminants, so that's the cattle, the sheep, and the goats that have the multiple stomachs, can eat stuff that pork and chicken, uh, pigs and chicken and others can't, and they can eat stuff that's really rough. And the biggest agricultural land use in California is actually grazing land. It's our hillsides. And we actually need to have more value placed on the environmental services that our cattle people and the sheep and the goat people provide by grazing that biomass down and we need to be more actively doing it. So I agree with everything that's been said. I would say that some of the livestock have a virtually unique and very efficient ecosystem service role that we shouldn't forget. We just need to reframe. Well, let's shift this a little bit. And, and Tom, let's read me that you, uh, my, gam my grandfather was a game and fish warden for the state of Montana. When I was a kid, he had 10,000 head. And then when he retired, we had 2,500 head. And then our family, you know, sold, sold the ranch. And um, like food also is our culture. You're talking about it being our job. It's our culture. And, and you obviously don't want to export this horrible systematic culture to other countries. But fundamentally, how do, we, how do we create a new food system that does not separate people from their great memories of food, from their ability to connect with their family to food? You know, I, I went through 12 years of making food choices super conscientiously, all about like what was best for the world. My family could no, could no longer eat with me. <laughs> and, and, and I sort of separated with them. Like, they were like, they hated it. So I kind of shifted back to, you know, to belong. And uh, so how does, how does this migrate into all of allowing us to preserve our cultural traditions uh, I think, at the same time? Bruce, yeah. I think that is such a critical question, Poe. Um, I was on a podcast earlier today and they were saying, how do we convince people to change? It's like, we don't convince people to change. That has been a failed experiment. Um, per capita meat consumption, in the United States in 2019 was the highest it has been in recorded history. Nobody on this podcast isn't aware of the inefficiencies or the climate change. Probably everybody on this podcast, if they, I mean, on this webinar, if they've tuned in is aware of the antibiotics issue. Most of them are aware, um, you know, not everybody in society, but lots of people know about this. People know slaughterhouses are not pleasant places. And yet per capita meat consumption just goes up and up and up. There's something about human physiology. We like meat, we wanna eat meat, we want the sensory experience of meat. So rather than continuing to beat our head against this wall of like trying to educate people out of what they're just going to do, let's change the meat. I mean, that's the brainstorm mm -hmm. of Indie Bio and Obvious Ventures. That's the goal of the Good Food Institute. Let's give, don't, don't force people to sacrifice. Instead of trying to change human nature, which has been tried and failed, let's change the end product. Let's make it from cultivation. Sure. Let's make it from plants. Let's make it from fermentation. That's the solution. James, what are your feelings about connecting to culture? I mean, you talked, opening anecdote, you talked about Beyond Meat. So last night was a Tuesday. So well, it didn't sound like it was Taco Tuesday at your house, but it was where, but at least it was, be, you know, Beyond Meat crumble at your house. And you can use it as wood and people can do, do what they like with it. It's one of the greatest things about the product is everybody gets to customize it and work with it and, and enjoy what they eat, right? Totally. I mean, my household is a no meat household. So, but, but it's so funny to see different preferences, even within the vegan and vegetarian world. You know, um, my son likes the Beyond Sausage. I prefer the Beyond Beef that I can actually cook into different dishes. And, you know, it's great to see 
beyond impossible, all of these companies, they're like a band of brothers and sisters creating these new products that mimic a lot of the familiarity and culture that you, that you bring up, Poe. You know, for me, a, a, a powerful read for me was when I read the book Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foyer, where he talked about his grandmother and what his, you know, uh, his grandmother taught him about food and the importance of food in their Jewish family and the culture. It was all wrapped together. And he was trying to unpack that and tie it into his feelings about, um, you know, animal cruelty and, you know, what, what it takes, uh, what happens to that, that, that chicken before it gets onto your plate, you know. Um, and there's just a lot of tension there. And I think um, it's going to take time. I think consumers are getting smarter and smarter. I think a lot of big food companies don't give consumers enough credit for their intelligence. They're connecting that what they eat is connected to their health, the health of their kids, and the health of the planet. And the more people build those connections, the more they start to say, well, what are my choices? What am I actually putting in my body? And maybe I should expand my horizons and look at some of these new choices. So um, let's ask about, you know, without overdosing on technology, I'd love to ask you guys, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, let me frame the question in another, a slightly different way. You know, James and I actually were talking about this last week, but we're, we're all very excited about the new technologies coming along, very excited about the plant-based proteins. What's the future of this? Like 10 years from now, what's the Beyond Meat Burger? What's going to be in the Beyond Meat Burger or the Beyond Meat Crumble or Shrimp or, or and, and so many other great brands? And I know many are in the audience. You're all great. We support you. Like, but like, where, what, what are the technologies that are going to take this uh, to another level, either on the di distribution side, like in your space, Christine, or like, what are the exciting technologies that are beyond the ones that are in the press today? And Bruce, why don't you start? Because I know you, this is right up your alley. So I feel like I'm talking too much. I keep wanting, I want to do all the talking. I keep wanting to jump in. But um, so I was going to restrain myself, but then you call on me. Um, the fermentation has been in the chat a little bit, and it's exciting. And um, it's really neat to see companies um, that started out in IndieBio five or six years ago, um, raising hundreds of millions of dollars focused on precision fermentation. Um, whole biomass fermentation is super exciting and it's kind of fascinating to realize that corn launched in 1985 and the next whole biomass <laughs> fermentation product uh, started this year. Uh, but there are multiple very exciting companies um, using whole biomass fermentation and a um, little plug, the Good Food Institute, we just released a like 75 page report on fermentation. So it's the science, who are the investors, what are the startup companies, etc. Uh, it makes for, I think, very fascinating reading. People can check it out at, at gfi.org slash uh, industry. We've also got a plant-based and a cultivated meat uh, report there as well. Christine, in the, in the produce side, um, are the, what are the technologies that help make uh, your system work even better in the future? Well, one thing that we're expanding into because we're seeing so much um, interest and change is around not only fermentation, but around preservation um, and processing. So, um, you know, anything from IQF freezing, uh, a lot around that, um, pureeing, powdering. Um, and, you know, there's just, I think, a lot that can and will and needs to be done, not only for tr nutrition purposes and extracting things out of it as much as possible, but making it last as long as possible. Um, I think we'll see a lot more in that avenue. Um, you know, totally separate from produce, I think there might be some more done with things like algae um, that, you know, is really helpful uh, from a carbon perspective and a, a nutrition perspective. Um, so just say those are a couple of things that I'm seeing firsthand um, in terms of what's happening in food. Yeah, James, I'll come to you a second, but I'll just put in there, we, you know, we at IndieBio, a lot of fermentation was on sugar, but really we're a carbon planet. We're just looking for a source of carbon and plenty of carbon in the air. And our ability to take that carbon right out of the air or out of cement emissions and make it go right into the food or right into fermentation is exciting for us. James, what do you see as the sort of the future of the, the technology that impacts the next 10 years of this space? 
Well, th three things come to mind. I mean, what, one that came up earlier is, you know, uh, cellular meat, um, you know, growing animal meat cells without, without any, you know, animal welfare involved. That's going to take a long time to scale, but there's some of our greatest minds working on it. And I think that's, that's one interesting vector. In the near term, you know, two things that I see a lot at Obvious. One is just new new innovation in plant protein you know we're not done we're just getting started and the excitement around regenerative ag is getting us past this monoculture of like how efficiently can we grow corn and soybeans and we're starting to look at all you know the, nature has given us so many interesting molecules so lupini beans you know from europe uh duckweed you know just really interesting new protein sources i talked to one startup that's working with watermelon seeds, you know, Christine, that would be like getting paid to take that as a waste product and, uh, and then using it as a protein. And then the, the last area I'll mention, which is technically not plant-based protein, um, that's mycoproteins. There's some, so much happening in the, in the myco uh, mushroom world. There's a startup that I'm not an investor in, but that I'm a big fan of out of Colorado called Meaty. M-E-A-T-I, and they're using very fast growing mycelium root systems to create this really uh, textured fibrous kind of substrate that you can then season and flavor to create uh, a whole cut meat alternative, a sirloin, a duck breast, a chicken breast. And the, the innovation that, that they're demonstrating is really exciting. That's great. Tom, in, in your sector, what do you feel like the yeah. technologies that impact the, the coming decade for you? So I'm, I'm interested in all the things that people have mentioned and the tech side of it. I think the most exciting thing in what I follow is more on the ag input side. And that's the two terms, agroecology and biotechnology. And as of yesterday, I was on a Zoom call with about 40 people with some of the Rome-based institutions in food and agriculture. And finally, people are talking about how do we bring the, the tools of biotechnology into an agroecological perspective? And how, how might that manifest itself? We're already seeing startups in, um, it's, it's mycology, but it's in terms of nitrogen fixation and how we manage the soil microbiome. And, you know, we're still just at the beginning of like a Copernican revolution in observation of the soil as a living thing. Most of our biodiversity is actually below ground and those organisms all have functional roles. And the big one, of course, is nitrogen. I mean, you mentioned carbon in the air. The air is 70% or more nitrogen. The biggest climate signature of the food system is nitrogen synthesis. We're out there burning natural gas to drive the temperature and pressure and stripping hydrogen atoms to take N2 and convert it into ammonia. If, if that hadn't been invented in the 20th century, the human population would be probably less than half of what it is because people would have starved. So we're addicted to it, but being able to actually manage soil microbiology in a commercially viable way is something that, I mean, I, I sort of predicted this about 10 years ago, I thought it was going to be 10 in, in, within 10 years. I'm starting to see it happening. I think it's accelerating. Um, maybe the Europeans are a bit ahead on this. Uh, it's starting to come to the US too. But I think there's great opportunities for startups in that sector. Yeah, all of this is, is both in some ways a tragedy and an opportunity, right? Like uh, organic farming is still like 1.5% of land. Like that is, both sad and a tremendous opportunity for us to, to yeah. make more changes, right? And um, if I could, I want to go back and there's some, a couple of the questions in the chat a bit about this, but, you know, Tom, you were talking about like losing your family farm and, and, and I talked about losing my grandfather's farm. And um, I, I think it's important to understand that, that, that while fewer jobs are in agriculture, they're still in food. They're at the end of the system. They're at restaurants. They're in food service, right? So it's jobs in food. There's food employs so many people. It's just not necessarily on the farm in the same. Absolutely. And uh, but I do do, do want to ask about sort of the uh, 
equity element of the economics of the food system and how to make sure that uh, all people are sort of economically benefit. You know, uh, your average grocery store, uh, the average uh, um, uh, clerk who is reloading the, the shelves is paid $7.85 an hour, and they last on average eight months, and they have 65% have to be turned over. And people don't like these jobs. They pay so little, um, and we're sort of crushing people down. Is there anything we can do from other end of the system, or as investors, as policy thinkers, Try to make sure that all these people who are in the food system still actually have a sustainable life. Uh, we want a sustainable planet, but that means that we have sustainable lives too. Is there any leverage we have that can impact this? Bruce? Yeah, I mean, I think political lobbying uh, is our leverage. So, I mean, this is what I was talking about at the beginning of the call, but GFI's um, big focus, and it really is I mean, it's a win for the global poor and the climate, but it's also a win for farmers and manufacturing. Um, and it's been interesting to us as we've been lobbying all over the world, um, but especially on Capitol Hill, the kind of um, strange alliances that exist when you start talking about technological innovation, using innovation to solve these really big problems. Um, and you're talking about funding land grant universities, and you're talking about bringing manufacturing back uh, to rural areas, um, and it's something where you get um, people on sort of the progressive side of the political spe spectrum excited about addressing antibiotic resistance and climate change and ocean eutrophication. Um, but we also had the Charles Koch Institute uh, co-sponsor our Good Food Conference uh, last year because they're interested in science funding. They're interested in things like the Ni National Science Foundation grant to UC Davis, and uh, we worked with a researcher at Washington State University to get some money from USDA for pea protein characterization research. Um, these sorts of things transcend political boundaries and they end up being good, not just in this sort of like macro, let's talk about antibiotics and climate change, uh, but also in this micro agricultural research is really good for farmers. It's good for rural communities. It's good for manufacturing. It's good for land grant universities. And it has a significant multiplier. So uh, anybody who wants to lobby your member of Congress uh, on this issue, we'd be happy to, happy to chat with you uh, at the Good Food Institute. And if you have connections uh, to members of Congress, House or Senate side, uh, happy to work with you to you know, help uh, get more money uh, from, uh, from you know, the various agencies where this makes sense uh, into this open access research that'll help us make uh, more companies like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat uh, and all the other companies we've been talking about. So we had a good question in the in the Q and A or the chat over here, which is let's take the question down to maybe as the last, just down to a single farm, a large farm, small farm. But like, if you have a farmer that is doing livestock now, how do you persuade that farmer to do row crops or other other forms of crops uh, instead of, of other produce and uh, instead of raising the animals? That their economic future would be better uh, with the land going towards the plants, not to the animals. Christina, you, you, or uh, Tom, go ahead, but I want to- Well, I was just gonna say that, that farmers do respond to market signals. And thanks to plant-based protein, there's so much more interest in legume-based crop rotations. So, so we shouldn't despair too much because if, I think it does get back to the policy arena because we, what we really need to do very quickly is, is to get the incentives aligned with the true costs and the kind of future we want. Um, but I, I think as, as demand shifts, farmers will fall. Christine, you, you must be on seeing a lot, a lot of farms and, and they're probably doing a variety of mixed use. Do you have a sense as to how they look at these economics or how to help them? Yeah, I mean, all I know is that we have senior people at some of the largest farms in the country coming to us because, you know, labor is going up by 70%, logistics is going up, and, you know, they are desperate to find new ways of getting more out of their land, and that's what we come in is almost a free, you know, support to help with additional incremental sales that they would have not otherwise reached because it's one of the last opportunities to get more out of their harvest without 
you know, GMOs and, you know, crazy technology to, to extrapolate more out of the produce itself in, in artificial ways or more, um, you know, not that there's not natural ways, but sometimes they're incentivized to do things that um, I don't think are healthier for some of the, the way that we're growing things just to get more out of it. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to do what we can there. Um, I would just say that, you know, in general, they need more incentives and that's what, you know, we work on one piece of that, but, you know, I think that there's a lot that can be done from a policy perspective as well around, you know, incremental incentives around, um, you know, uh, selling or donating produce that they can't sell otherwise or other channels as a means to kind of balance that um, situation. I think one thing I'm hopeful will come out of COVID is a couple of things. I think it's brought to light um, not only, I mean, I was, you know, very um, happy to see for the first time ever people on Facebook posting pictures of farm laborers. That would have never happened before. Um, and it's just heartwarming to see that people are actually truly like, you know, the, the um, you know, the light is shining on truly who is running and feeding the country um, and how critical these laborers are and, and people are, and they need to be treated with respect and, and properly paid. Um, one of the best documentaries I watched years ago was called Food Chain. Um, and it was heartbreaking to see that they were on hunger strikes just to get one more penny per pound for a bucket of tomatoes. And, um, you know, it, it, we're not com fairly compensating our laborers, even with the quote unquote costs going up, we're not giving them proper health care and insurance. Um, and that needs to be baked in while we then push for incentives on other things to make up for it that are the right, you know, ways of dealing with it and incentives. Um, so we're just cutting in the, the wrong corners, I think, in the wrong ways. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what comes out of it, but I really hope that COVID, you know, helps push some of these policies to help support that. Um, and then, you know, the, the farm to family box program with the USDA, they put billions of dollars just recently. And it's interesting because I really hope that this is a light too, that this should continue because what better thing for government money to go towards than feeding people and helping to reduce food waste, the number one contributor to climate change. And if we're gonna put subsidies toward things, it's shocking to me still that there's not really subsidies towards a lot of produce. You know, why not it be towards helping growers get this excess and on top of that feeding people? So I'm hoping that this program, um, they realize how beneficial it's been and they continue it um, for the long term as well, so. There's a great final note to land on. We have just with a minute to go. I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank your organizations at Full Harvest and Obvious and Good Food Institute, UC Davis, for loaning you out to me for an hour in the middle of the day. Thank you so much. Uh, to all the audience members, thank you for listening. Thank you for your questions and your chat. I would encourage you to visit all of their organizations and get to know what they're doing. They're really special people with great hearts. You can see how much they care about the full thing. And uh, yeah, and then the Eventbrite, there's more information about all of the organizations and there's links. And, uh, and, and again, if you, if you enjoyed today, uh, audience members, thank you. We have a few more events in the coming weeks. And then uh, on October 28th, IndieBio has its demo day in, for the San Francisco batch, the day before the 27th for the New York batch. And you'll see some, there are some new solutions to these spaces that the world has never seen before. Very exciting to see. Thank you, panelists, again. Thank you so much. And I uh, hope to see you thank again. Thank you, Poe, for being our fearless leader and for all the great work that you and your team do at IndieBio. Thank you, Jess. Yes, second that. Thank you, everybody. Thank Appreciate you. Bye-bye. Great, great, great to be with all of you virtually. Thanks, Bob. It's good to see you again.